Um, Father, we thank you for this time that we have in your word. We thank you for your incredible, incredible goodness to us. We ask right now that you will pour out your spirit in our presence, that you will pour it out over us, that you will carve out this space, help our minds to be focused on you. We come with little things, big things, things that are heartaches, things that are annoying, things that have happened in our mornings, things we're thinking about that are happening later, and we put all of those at your feet right now. We confess our own sin, our own selfishness, our own need to control, and we put that at your feet too. We ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your spirit to pour out over us. We ask that we will experience you deeply in this time that we will know you better, Jesus, through studying your word, and that we will walk closer to you because of it. Grant us wisdom and knowledge that comes from you alone and help us to hear your voice and see your face in this time. In your name we pray, amen. All right, ladies. So we are on week 12, actually, of our study, week uh, three of Judges. You can go ahead and open up your Bibles to Judges 4, as that's where we will be. Um, and we will be reading most of Judges 4 and 5. Yeah, come, come have a seat. You're fine. Um, most of Judges 4 and 5 today. So we are also going to be focusing on the, the story of Deborah today, which is fun. Uh, Deborah is a great character. She is, it's fun to see a strong female character in the Old Testament. So we'll be looking at her. Um, as I've been studying Judges so far, I've been realizing, and I don't know if you ladies have been feeling the same, just how relevant Judges is to our life and our culture right now. Um, I've been deeply struck by how the issues of the Israelites are our issues as well. Do we exclusively worship at the altar of God? That's the question that is being asked of the Israelites. Where are you going to exclusively worship? And um, do, or do we worship at the altars of the gods around us? And we talked last week, um, I thought commentator Younger did such an amazing job of talking about the gods of our culture, the gods of self, the gods of materialism, of pluralism. We, I think sometimes we wonder at the Israelites who had seen the power of Yahweh in their lives, how they so quickly begin to worship the gods of the Canaanites around them, right? I think we wonder and we kind of even, at least inside of me, probably judge. Um, but then I think we have to step back and say, do we wholeheartedly worship Christ alone in our culture? Do, you know, saying that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him, that is so controversial right now in our culture. Because Mostly people say things like, oh, yeah, well, you know, we follow some of the truths of Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. We kind of incorporate those in. But, you know, maybe that's just finding God through another means. But who, you know, who am I to say there's just one God? I feel like we see that so much in our culture. But the answer is we're not saying there's just one God. Who is? Jesus. Jesus says there's one God, not me. It is not up to me to decide what is true and what is not true, right? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that's the application I want us to continually ponder as we continue to study judges is um, what are the other altars that I easily worship at? So instead of being quick to judge the Israelites, to think about ourselves, what altars do we easily worship at? In what ways am I even syncretistic, worshiping Christ? Christ, but also worshiping the gods of my neighbors. Because that was the issue with the Israelites. They wanted to worship Yahweh, but they also wanted to worship the gods of their neighbors around them. So um, as we begin today, so we're in week three of the book of Judges, I want us to remember our context. So first, I always like to ask, where are we in the story of Israel? Of Israel? So we remember that the Israelites are now somewhat of a nation. They have an ethnic identity that unites them. Yahweh as their God unites them. His intention is to be their king. The other nations have physical kings, but Yahweh wants to be their exclusive king. We know how it started with the covenant to Abraham, the three Ps, as we love to go over. Shout out a P for me, lady. What are the three Ps of the promise? Progeny, so that Abraham will have as many descendants as the stars in the sky, the sand on the shore. What's another one I heard? Progeny promise, so that somehow through, all, through the offspring of Abraham, the entire world will be blessed. And the last one is? 
place, exactly, that Canaan will be the everlasting inheritance to the people of Israel. So, but this is a covenant. This is a covenant based on them keeping their side of the agreement as well. So though the, and this covenant is renewed with the Abraham's descendants. And so though the Israelites sojourn in, in Egypt for 400 years, Yahweh intervenes to redeem them through the person of Moses, leading them back to, through the desert, through the trial and air of the desert period, bringing them back to Canaan. And Yahweh says, I will clear a space for you in this land. We will push back the Canaanites and drive them out. And then last week, ladies, I gave you two reasons that Yahweh wants to drive out the Canaanites. Now, the first one was revelation. Now, just to remind you, ladies, I like you to talk to me. So as I ask you questions, just shout out the answers. So the first one was revelation. God's plan is to reveal himself to the entire world as the one true God, the creator God, the God over every other ancient Near Eastern God worthy of worship in the ancient Near East. It was a pantheon of gods. Gods were attached to their nations. So the Egyptian gods, the Amorite gods. Now we have this guy saying he's the one true God, Yahweh, over all of them. So how do we know that he is more powerful than the Egyptian gods and the Amorite gods? What does Yahweh have to do? He has to defeat them in battle. Exactly. And so if a, God, if a nation is able to defeat another nation, it says that their God is bigger and stronger than the gods of the nations around them. So part of this plan is God revealing himself to the whole world. He is, has to do some amount of conquering, of pushing back these other nations to show that he is the one true God. So that's why you continually hear the refrain of the God who beat the Egyptians at the Red Sea, who beat the, the Amorite kings of Sihon and Og, because that's a reminder that God is revealing himself as the one true God, bigger than any other God. Those little G-gods, as Miss Susie likes to say, they cannot protect you. They cannot take care of you. They will not listen to you. Only God is the one true God. So one is revelation. Um, But the other thing is God wants them to push back the Canaanites from this land out of protection. That's the second period piece. So it's revelation and it's protection. So, uh, and it's, again, we've mentioned this before. It's not that the Canaanites themselves need to really be driven out, though they do. They are as part of the process. What about the Canaanites need to be driven from the land? It's their identity. Exactly. There's their identity that needs to be driven because, um, because God wants to protect the Israelites from their patterns, their behaviors, their lifestyle. So now regarding the Canaanites, what are the Israelites not to worship? They're not to worship the Canaanites idols. Exactly. They're not to worship their idols. They're not to worship at their altars. And now the other piece is their young men and women are not to do what? They're not to and or marry, not to marry the Canaanites. Marriage might lead to someone worshiping the idols of their spouse or at least tolerate them. Um, and then what about the children, of course? You know, what do you teach if you have a mixed marriage family? Those many of us who've had that situation, and it's a struggle. So you can see this as a protection. He says, don't worship at their altars. Don't intermarry because we are carving out a space for the Israelites to experience God, the one true God. So um, the first week, as we read Judges, we read that Joshua has died and that the Israelites are dispersed to their tribal allotments, the parcels of land allotted to each of the tribes. Um, we're told, they're told to drive out the Canaanites that are still in their midst. And for the most part, we read that Judah does, the tribe of Judah. But what's the refrain we hear repeated for the northern tribes? Do you remember? They did not drive out. They did not drive out the Canaanites still living in their tribal allotments. So last week we read the result of them not driving them out. I'm actually going to go back to Judges 3 and read verses 5 and 6. I remembered my readers today. Thank you, Deb. She, she was my pitch hitter last week. Okay, so, De- so Judges 3, 5 through 6 says, the Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. So that's the problem. So because they did not drive out the the Canaanites, the Israelites did the two things they were told not to do, but again, based on their protection, on protecting them. So who did they let their children marry? They let their children marry the... Canaanites, the sons and daughters, right? Exactly. And then who do they serve? They serve the gods of the Canaanites. Exactly. So, and then what's the result? The result actually goes back to Judges 1.10. 
210. <laughs> Here we go. Judges 210. So after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So because they worship at the altars of the Canaanites, because they intermarry, what's the result? The result is the next generation does not know the Lord. All right, so um, to me, that is one of the saddest lines in Judges, thinking about that. The next generation does not know the Lord. So last week, we talked about the cycle of Judges that is repeated with each judge. First, what does Israel do wrong? Do you remember what's the first step in the cycle? They do what? They, they, don't, talk, they, don't, talk to God first. they don't talk to God first. They, they, they worship the gods of their neighbors, right? So the first thing is that they worship the gods of their neighbors. That's kind of what starts their cycle of sin. They sin by worshiping Baal and Asherah typically. And then what does God then do to help them realize they've gone astray? What does he do? He... He allows a, another nation to come in and conquer them. Exactly. So the first step is they sin. They worship another God. Then God says, I'm going to let you know you're off track. So I'm not going to let you win in battle. I'm going to have you lose in battle. So you know that you're off track. So another nation comes in and defeats them in battle or conquers them. And not necessarily all of Israel, but a part, a tribe, a portion of Israel. So... Um, then what do the Israelites then do as a result? They cry out to God. Exactly. So that's the next step. So they sin. Another nation comes in, beats them in battle. They cry out to God. And then, I, but I mentioned that this isn't really like a repentant cry. It's more like a I'm help, save me cry. And so God, in his mercy and his love for his people, then sends who? He sends a judge, right, which is the Hebrew word sopatim. So the Sopo team lead the Israelites into battle and defeat the enemy. Then throughout the lifetime of that judge, that Sopo team, Israel is what? They are, during his lifetime, they are faithful. Exactly. So during the lifetime of that judge, they are then faithful to God. But when the Sopo team, the judge dies, what does Israel then do? They then... They go back to worshiping the gods of their neighbors. Exactly. So that's the cycle. It's worship the God of our, gods of our neighbors. Yahweh says, you're off track. I'm going to let you be defeated in battle. They are um, ruled by another nation or another king for a little while. They cry out to God. God in his mercy comes and intervenes with a judge, sends a judge. The judge saves them in battle for the lifetime of the judge. They are faithful. The judge dies. They go back to unfaithfulness. But I also mentioned that it is not necessarily this sort of just cyclical pattern. It's actually a downward spiral, right? Because each judge gets successively worse, and it says that they are even sort of worse at the end, that they then worship the gods of their neighbors even more. So it's not like you just go around in a circle. It's a downward drain circle. <laughs> it just keeps getting worse. The judges themselves keep getting worse as characters. Okay. So, um, so though in English, I was telling you ladies, we translate SOPA team as the word judge. We talked about how, um, really translating the word as judge is not an accurate translation of the word because they didn't decide court cases or enforce laws. The SOPA team were tribal leaders in two functions. So one, militarily, what did they do? They led in battle exactly so they and then two they acted more like a prophet what did they remember what they would do they would call the people back to god to faithfulness and we get that from judges 2 16 and 17 which gives their role so 2 16 and 17 then the lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders yet they would not listen to their judges but prostrated themselves to other gods and worship them they quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's command. All right, so 
let's uh, let's do a little bit of historical background before we dive into the story of Deborah. Um, we're not going to do a full um, look at historical background. If you want to hear all of it, go back and listen to two weeks ago. So that would be week 10 of our study. So um, we don't know, ladies, who wrote the book of Judges, but based on internal clues in the text, we can understand about when it was written, which does then help us realize who the audience was, who it was written to. So um, there are some reoccurring phrases that we went through for the last two weeks, which help us see that Judges was likely written after the northern kingdom of Israel had been taken into exile. As Judges 1830 mentions the northern tribes had been taken into captivity. It specifically refers to the tribe of Dan, but Dan was part of those northern tribes. So so there's a reference to Dan being taken into captivity, which gives us this time period of likely, therefore, after 722 BC, which was when that northern kingdom goes into exile. So as the monarchy is still in place, though, based on locations that are mentioned that still exist. And again, we went through the details of this the last two weeks. I'm just kind of summarizing. Um, it, we believe that things, um, things that would have ended after the exile, locations that no longer would be there, town names, things like that. We believe that Judges is therefore written before the second exile. So in the time period of 722 to 586 BC, so 136 years spread. So that's when we believe that Judges was written during that time period. So after the second, for, after the Northern Kingdom has gone into exile, but before the Southern Kingdom. So if Judges is written during these years, then ladies, who is the audience? Who is this written to? It's written to the southern kingdom. Exactly. So the Israelites still living in the southern kingdom of Israel. I mentioned the Hebrew Bible doesn't place judges with the historical literature. But what category does it place it in? Do you ladies remember? In the theological, theological yes, but prophetic. prophetic. Exactly. So judges is placed within prophetic literature. So in general, ladies, What is prophetic literature trying to do? What is prophecy trying to do? It's trying to call people back to a right relationship with God. Exactly. So if Judges is prophetic, written after the northern tribes have failed Yahweh and are taken into exile, but while the southern kingdom of Judah is still in existence, when the monarchy is still in existence, what do you think, ladies, would be the purpose of these stories in Judges? If it's directed at the southern kingdom. To show them what could happen if they don't get back in a right relationship. Totally. So to show them what will happen if they do not return to a right relationship with God. Because they're not in a good place either, the southern kingdom, during their monarchy. They're not being totally faithful. The Judah, the southern kingdom, is more faithful than the northern kingdom, but that just extends their time going into exile a little bit later. They are not very faithful either. I will get to them at some point. I think probably, I know this is funny, my brain is already thinking this way, but probably in two years, I think we will do uh, kings and prophets and go through that whole time period of the monarchy. Um, So, which will be fine. But anyway, so if we are therefore still, the southern kingdom still exists, is being written to this kingdom, so yes, I believe it is being, these stories are selected to tell people who God is and who they are in relationship to him, to call them back into a faithful relationship with God. So reminding them of what happens when we do not fully yield to Yahweh, when our hearts do go after the gods of our neighbors. So the stories and judges are considered historical. They actually happened But as I've mentioned before, they are not an attempt to give an impartial history of everything that happened during this time period. They are chosen for theological reasons. They are stories, again, to show us who God is and who we are in relationship to him. So, and to call people back into a right relationship with God. Now, one thing we've also covered in the last two weeks is when, what were the years in history that Judges covers? I go through a full timeline of that in the last two weeks, but I'm just going to say very briefly, it, historically, it begins when who dies, when our main character from the last book, Joshua, exactly. So historically, the time period of the judges starts when Joshua dies, and then until when, it ends at what time, when what begins? When they get a king, right, with the monarchy. So when Saul becomes king. So it's the time period from Joshua to Saul. 
is the time period of the judges, which date-wise is somewhere around 1399 B.C. to 1052 B.C. So it covers about 350 years of time before the actual monarchy begins. Sure. Um, the early date would be 1399 B.C. That would be, we believe Joshua probably dies potentially 10 to 20 years later than that date, but that's the date of conquering, of the majority of the conquering of the land of Canaan. So 1399 will be our early date. 1052 B.C. is when we think that Saul becomes king. Some give or take a year or two, but around that time period. So 1399 to 1052, so that's about 350 years of time period that's covered. So again, that's a little confusing, but we talk, one, about the time period it covers, but also, two, about the time period it was written. So this is our first book, as I've mentioned, ladies, that was written much later than it actually occurred. Up until now, we've been reading books that were written by eyewitnesses, except for Genesis. Moses writes uh, Genesis. But everything else, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those are all written by Moses as an eyewitness. And then Joshua, we believe, was mostly written by Joshua as well. Judges is our first book that's likely written a couple hundred years later. Okay, so today we're going to read Judges 4 through 5, the story of Deborah. So Judges 4 actually gives us the narrative account of Deborah and Barak. And then Judges 5 is actually a poetic victory hymn. So we're going to read them both, though we'll spend more time on Judges 4, because together they really provide the full picture of what happens, the full story. So we're going to start with the narrative, uh, which starts with setting up plot and characters. So this is a very well-constructed story. We get plot and characters. We get people described and mentioned. So let's start with Judges 4, 1 through 3, and begin to set our setting. All right, Judges 4, 1 through 3. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now the Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harosheth, Hagoyim, because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. They cried out to the Lord for help. All right, so... We skipped the story of Ehud. We didn't read it last week uh, in chapter three, but we can kind of guess what happens in it. So it's the same cycle of apostasy, oppression, cry out to God, mercy and salvation. So Ehud is also specifically mentioned here because we believe that he and Deborah lived in the same place. So they're saying, okay, after the time of Ehud, he's died. Now Deborah is our next main character in that same area. So um, the area of Israel that was faithful to Yahweh during the time of Ehud is the same area Deborah is called to. So after D Ehud dies, verse 1 says, what do the Israelites do? They do, what does it say? Evil. evil. They do evil in the eyes of the Lord. So Yahweh sells them into the hands of who? Who does it say? Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in a town called Hazor. Jabin has a commander of the army. What's his name? His name is? Sisera. Good. And what does Jobin and Sisera have that make them very strong? Verse 3. They have 900 iron chariots. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, commentator Younger notes that chariots were generally used to chase fleeing soldiers so that even after they won a battle, they could chase the retreating troops as far as they could and continue to slaughter them. So, Fully route, conquer, defeat. That was the goal of the chariot. So now, where are all these places? So I have a couple maps for you ladies. On the back of your um, class notes, actually start with the little one, the half map on the back of your class notes. That actually is very specific to the time of Deborah. And so you can see where um, Hazor is at the top of the map. You can see, and then keep your eye on that, because now we're going to look and see where Deborah is located in all of this as well. So do you see the half map on the back of your class notes? That's the specific one to Deborah. And then the larger one is actually two different ways to look at Israel. One is interesting because it shows just where the different um, judges likely had influence. Um, again, the judges did not rule or were not tribal leaders of all of Israel. They were just parts of it. Um, and then the other one I actually thought was interesting, um, the one that is from, I think it says, starts with uh, time of Joshua, 1200 B.C., 
Um, that one I think is interesting because it really shows where um, though Israel was supposed to occupy all of Canaan, it actually shows that they did not occupy all of it. In fact, let me grab one of those. Um, I think, let's see. Nope, that's last week. Okay, so this one I think is really interesting because, okay, this one shows the amount of area that was allotted to the Israelites, all the different tribal allotments. And you can see where the judges are and all of them. This one is interesting because do you see how they actually don't seem to occupy all of that space? Do you see how there's this whole area by the coast that they don't occupy? That's where the Philistines are going to live. And they're going to be a huge thorn in their flesh. And you can also see this whole area up here is also not occupied east of the Jordan. So this town of Hazor is right here up at the top. But you can also see it's barely inside Israelite territory, right? So this guy, Jabin, Jabin, is ruling from up in this area, barely inside the Israelite area. But he's gotten some authority. Okay, so um, Jabin reigns from the top, from Hazor. Uh, he's the very northern part of Israel. Now, what Sopa team is Yahweh going to call? And we get to meet her. Deborah. Okay, so Judges 4, verses 4 through 5. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. All right. The NIV takes a little bit of liberty, so we're going to look at some of these words. Um, So what is Deborah called? Verse 4. She's called a prophetess okay the hebrew word is nabiah which is just exactly the feminine form of the same male word in hebrew nabi for prophet other women are also called prophetesses in the old testament Uh, anyone remember anyone else who was called a prophetess a little trivia in the old testament starts with moses's sister remember her Miriam. Yeah, Miriam is called a prophetess um, in the Old Testament. Another one, Huldah, in 2 Kings 22, 14. She's also called a prophetess. When we get to the New Testament, there's Anna is called a prophetess. So we see that this is a role that is definitely the Holy Spirit is on certain women at different times, just like the Holy Spirit is on different men at certain times throughout the Old Testament. Um, And then now into the New Verse, um, okay, so verse four in the NIV, though, so she was leading Israel at that time. So the Hebrew word here is actually just our word we've been seeing the whole time, sopata. Simply, it's the singular form of the plural sopatim. So the same word the NIV elsewhere translates as judge. So many of your translations, if you don't have the NIV, probably says that she was judging Israel at the time. Liz, how would Great question. How was she, how did she get to be a judge? Well, as we're kind of going to see, I don't think a judge was an office. It was more a recognition. So it's the whole, it's God would select someone. The Holy Spirit would sort of dwell on them in a greater way. And there would be a sense of recognition from the people around them that they had been called by God in a special way. So it was not, this was not like an elected position. She was not like a court. It was not a court where she was deciding cases. Um, Yes, exactly. So, yeah, she, it was not inherited. It wasn't elected. It was this more sense of designation, a recognition of certain people having God's spirit on them and being equipped for that moment. The people recognized it, which we see, actually, in, the, in how the people respond to her. Um, the, so the other, yes, other, other translations say she was judging. So then the NIV chooses the word leading, um, that she was leading Israel at that time because one reason commentators were saying that possibly the NIV chooses that word is because she doesn't embody both characteristics typically of a judge. Verse 5 says she held court under the palm of Deborah. Here the word is Yosebet, which is better translated as sit, remain, dwell, or inhabits. So she sits, she dwells under the palm of Deborah um, between Ramah and Bethel in Ephraim. So if you go back to the map of Israel, um, you can see then where she is located. So she's located 
really in the middle of Israel. You can see, anyone see where Bethel is? The big, the, the little map or the half map really shows very specifically, and that might help you then locate it on the bigger map. So you can see where she's located. So she's actually quite a fair different distance from Hazor. She's in the middle of Israel. This guy, Javin, he's at the top of Israel. So the, uh, the other phrase that's a little bit misleading is it says that she, um, for judging, it says, it's the word ha mispat. Uh, oh no, well, people, it says people came to have their disputes decided. Did you see that? So that's the word judging, which is ha mispat, meaning judgment. So it's Deborah, a prophetess, a woman who heard from God, spoke for God to the people of Israel to call them back to a right relationship with God. She acted as sopata, sat judging, but in the sense of half of the role of a sopatim. Because, uh, so the NIV says she's leading Israel, but it's more like she is truth speaking to Israel. The sense that people are coming to her because she clearly has God's spirit dwelling on her. She has wisdom. And because this job, because she's called a sopata, a sopatim, a judge, which we know is not someone who sits in court and decides cases, but someone who leads Israel into battle and speaks God's word to them. So she's identified in this role of a sopata. So we're going to see that she ha- acts out essentially half of this role. So um, Deborah takes on half of the sopa team role, calling people into a right relationship with God. This common commentator block I've been reading describes her function like this. He says, the sons of Israel came to Deborah for the judgment. They are not asking her to solve their legal disputes, but to give them the divine answer to their cries which is described in the following verses. The fact that the Israelites come to her instead of a priest reflects the failure of the established priestly institution to maintain contact with God, a spiritual tragedy explicitly described in the early chapters of 1 Samuel. So she is acting in this prophetess role and people are coming to her because they recognize that that sits on her, that she is God's mouthpiece. So That's why it's a little bit misleading when it's translated as judging and deciding cases, because that does not seem to be what she was doing. There were elders who would sit outside the city gates and do that. That doesn't seem to be her role. She is a prophetess. She's speaking God's word. She's calling people into right relationship, and she's helping people understand God's word. That seems to be more of what she's doing in this circumstance. So, um, but she does not take on this other half because remember, the two jobs of the tribal leaders of the Sopa team were speak God's word to the people, lead out in battle. So Judges 4, 6 through 10 shows us who is called into that military part of the position. All right, Judges 4, 4, uh, four, four or 4, 6. Okay, so well, I'll just read that again. So now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel, was judging Israel at that time. She held court. She sat under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their judgments. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kedesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Go take with you 10,000 men. This is 10 elifs again. So not necessarily 10,000, but 10 units of people or clans of people. Men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his troops to Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly, I will go with you, said Deborah, but because of the course you are taking, their honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and ten elifs of men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. Okay, so Deborah, a prophetess, she's a mouthpiece for Yahweh, tells Barak, very, you see this first person, she has heard from God, tells Barak to lead the Israelites into battle. She tells him Yahweh will fight for the Israelites and he will destroy Jabin's army. Now we see here then Barak being this other half of the Sopatim role. He's the one called to be this military leader at this point. Deborah gives the commission speech. Barak is reluctant, as we see. He says he won't go unless Deborah does what? Unless she... (laughs) She goes with him. Now, Barak is sometimes portrayed as this sort of like 
weak-willed man. He needs Deborah to hold his hand. Younger, commentator Younger says, Barack is more, more desires Deborah's presence as a source of oracular inquiry, as he wants to guarantee that things will go auspiciously. So the sense that she's the one who speaks for God, I need her to come with me because I need to know what God is going to tell me to do. And it's almost like this good luck charm. Like she needs to come with me so I can ensure that everything goes well. So really though, Barack is entrusting in God's word because she has told him what to do. She has told him God's word. And he needs to, his, his job would be to simply then act that out. But we see him saying, oh, kind of like, well, what if he tells me something different? Or what if I need to inquire? What if I need my good luck charm? So he really is attempting to manipulate the outcome is what he's trying to do. So what is the outcome? Well, first, we're going to meet one other character in the plot. So Judges 4, 11 through 17. Now, Heber the Kenite um, had... Do I actually want to read that far? Let me check. Sorry, checking the notes. Um, yeah, we do. Okay. Now, Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zanamium, near Kadesh. I'll come back to that. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor... Sisera summoned from Haroth Hagoyim in the Kishon River all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 or 10 elas of men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Har- Hirosheth, Hagoyim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite. All right, so we meet Heber the Kenite in this, story, in this portion. We learn actually here that the Kenites were descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law. So the Hebrew word used for brother-in-law here can also be translated as father-in-law. We remember that Moses, from last year, remember that Moses' wife joins them after they have exited Egypt. And, they, uh, and also that her father, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, also comes and joins them as well. Um, Numbers 10, 29 through 33. Now Moses said to Hobab, son of Reuel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place about which the Lord said, I will give to you. Come with us and we will treat you well. For the Lord has promised good things to Israel. He answered, no, I will not go. I'm going back to my own land and my own people. But Moses said, please do not leave us. You know where we should camp in the wilderness and you can be our eyes. If you come with us, we will share with you whatever good things the Lord gives us. So they set out for the mountain of the Lord and traveled for three days. We also learn from the beginning of Judges that the Kenites had been incorporated into the tribe of Judah. Judges 1.16 says, The descendants of Moses' father-in-law, the Kenite, went up to the city of Palms with the men of Judah to live among the people of the, de- of the desert of Judah in the Negev near Arad. So this Kenite, Heber, you know, he's a descendant of Moses' father-in-law, but he's not satisfied with living among the Israelites. He's not satisfied being part of the tribe of Judah. So he's not satisfied clearly with worshiping Yahweh. So who has he therefore made an alliance with? He's made an alliance with Javan, exactly, this Canaanite king who is currently oppressing Israel. It says that they had friendly relations, which in Hebrew is simply the word shalom. So they had shalom between them. Shalom means peace, welfare, soundness, a sense of completeness. It's the word that is still used in Hebrew for coming and going. When you meet someone, you say shalom. When you leave, you say shalom. It's a sense of peace being with you, peace in that relationship. Um, Now, um, Hebrew chooses shalom with Jabin, which alienates him from the shalom of Yahweh. We hear from this account that Yahweh does rout Sisera's army. Verse 15 is 
it's clear that it's not the 10 Elifs of the Israelites that bring victory, but it's Yahweh the Lord routes Sisera. He flees on foot to Heber, uh, the Kenite, because Heber and Jabin are allies. Deborah has already said that Barak will not get the honor for this victory. And who's going to get it instead? What is it? Remember? Said a woman is going to get it instead. Now, that kind of makes us automatically think, oh, well, the story is about a woman. It's probably going to be Deborah who's going to get the honor for this. But we're actually going to see it's a different woman who's going to get the honor. And we're going to meet her here. So Judges 4, 17 through 22. Or 18. Now, Jael went out to meet Sisera. So we've learned that Jael is the wife of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered the tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone in here? Say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quickly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Just then, I know, <laughs> poison milk, you know, another thing that also would have worked. Just then Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites and the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. All right. So Jael's husband has chosen Shalom um, with Yahweh, not with her husband. You see that? That it was Heber, the Canaanite, chose Shalom with Jabin, but not his wife. So Jael is not an Israelite. She is not a person of the covenant. But like Rahab and like Ruth that we see, like other women that are on the outside, she recognizes Yahweh as the one true God and aligns herself with him. So who is the woman who gets the honor for this victory? It's it's Jael. It's not Deborah. This concludes the prose section of the account of Deborah. We'll read actually through some sections of the poetry as well and kind of mine it for a few important details. It's actually considered one of the oldest poems in the Old Testament. It functions as a victory hymn to Yahweh. And it's similar to Exodus 15. Do you remember after they crossed the Red Sea where Miriam leads women in singing and there's this victory hymn? Um, Very similar in style to that. Now, what's interesting is though, whereas Judges is likely written 500 years after it occurred, Um, we really believe based on Judges 5.1 that this victory hymn was written concurrently with events. So that this victory hymn was an original piece written right when it happened that is then there later incorporated. It was probably written down, it was probably kept, and later incorporated into this book of Judges when it becomes an actual book. So Judges 5.1 says, On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. The idea that this happens exactly in that moment, sung on that day. All right. Um, So we believe this hymn was written down at the time of victory uh, and later incorporated into the book. So many believe that Deborah may have even written this hymn herself. A um, A lot of the verses are set in first person. It's also the Hebrew of this, and I don't read Hebrew, but commentators noted that the Hebrew in this section is very archaic, is very, very old. Actually, 70% of the verses of this poem, according to commentator Block, um, have words that are very ambiguous. So uh, this is one of those instances where we say the original Hebrew is 100% true, the word of God, infallible, but our English translations (laughs) may not necessarily be. Um, but we still get the gist of, of what's going on in this victory hymn. The surrounding verses before and after the hymn are definitely classical Hebrew, very easy to understand, which again shows likely how old this original hymn was. It was written in such an archaic form of Hebrew. All right, so let's read bits of it. So Judges 5, 2 through 3. 
when the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings, listen to you, listen, you rulers. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel, in song. So this is interesting. These are some verses that are, are really disputed in meaning. But commentator Block and Younger say that the, the word princes is actually translated as hair. And, and num- in Numbers 6, 5 and Ezekiel 44, 20. So Younger says because hair was, was translated as because hair was unbound in Israel or when locks were loosened in Israel, this suggests dedication to the purposes of Yahweh, similar to like taking a Nazarite vow. You know how they would let their hair grow long? So that what he says is these verses are saying the idea is that when people willingly offer themselves to God, great things happen this sense of willingly going with him. So the next verse is picture God on the move. They picture him as magnificent, but also um, it's really interesting. Look how the time period of the judges is described. So notice that from these verses. So judges five, four through nine. When, um, when you, Lord, went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, rose, until I arose a mother in Israel, God chose new leaders when war came to the city gates, but not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. So verse six, how does it describe the roads? They are what? They're abandoned, right? Do you see that? The travelers took to winding paths, meaning they took to the roads that were not the main roads at that time. Village life can also be translated as warriors. So there were no warriors at this time. So Younger offers an interesting translation to it. Um, Page 194 of his book, I'm going to read. Okay, so he says, a better translation would be, the roads, the caravans were abandoned, and those traveling went on winding paths, Warrior ceased, they ceased in Israel. So that's the description of this time period. So why would the roads be abandoned, ladies? Because they would be what? They'd be dangerous, exactly, and safe. So what does Israel therefore seem like at this time? How would you ladies describe it? Say that again. Ghost town. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Say more about that. Any additions? Like we were in COVID. (laughs) Totally. Scared, staying in your homes, right? Not out. That's such a great, great description. Yeah, so the road seemed unsafe. Um, So notice, um, so now we're going to skip down to verse 13. This hymn praises the tribes that participated in Barak's army. And notes those who don't show up. So notice that there's this assessment that's going on, this moral and spiritual, as Younger points out. Their evaluation is positive or negative depending on whether they involve themselves in the battle. So we're going to read verses 13 through 18. And again, think about who shows up and who doesn't show up. 13 through 18. The remnant of the nobles came down. The people of the Lord came down to me against the mighty. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots were in Amalek. Benjamin was with the people who followed you. From Machir, captains came down. From Zebulun, those who bear a commander's staff. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak, sent under his command into the valley in the districts of Reuben. There was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the sheep pens? Oh, sorry, pause. In the districts of Reuben... There was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the sheep pens to hear the whistling for the flocks in the districts of Reuben? There was much searching of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he linger by the ships? Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his covers. The people of Zebulun risked their very lives, as did Naphtali on the terraced fields. 
So verses four, verse 14, what three tribes show up? You can just shout them out. Who shows up? Ephraim, I heard. Who else does it say? Benjamin, Zebulun. Okay, so these three show up. Macher is a subdivision of Manasseh. So it's saying the Manasseh also shows up. Verse 15, who else shows up with, Be- with Barak? What else is named? Issachar, good. But with Reuben, there is searching of heart. Verse 16, where does Reuben stay? He stays among the campfires and flocks. Meaning, did he join the battle? No, nope. <laughs> he did not show up. Where does Gilead stay? Verse 17, they stay beyond the Jordan, meaning the eastern side of the Jordan River. Gilead refers to the three tribes on the eastern side of Jordan, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So they don't show up. So where does Dan linger? What does it say? He lingers by the ships on the coast. And Asher, where does he remain? He remains on the coast in his coves. So in contrast, the people of Zebulun and Naphtali risk their lives. So in contrast to these insiders who don't show up for the battle, we get an outsider who does. And hear this great praise of Jael. So verse 24. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite, most blessed of tent-dwelling women. He asked for water, she gave him milk. In a bowl fit for nobles, she brought him curdled milk. Her hand reached for the tent peg, her right hand for the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera, she crushed his head, she shattered and pierced his temple. At her feet he sank, he fell, there he lay. At her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. So... We see this contrast, right, between those who don't show up, even though they are Israelites, versus this woman who's an outsider who does show up. Now, this last section um, shifts to this perspective of Sisera's mother. It seems very strange when you read it. She seems to represent, though, Sisera himself, the motives of his heart. She is also in contrast to Jael, who submits herself to Yahweh. So, This is the description of Sisera's mom, but let's look for some interesting little tidbits we get from it. Through the window peered Sisera's mother. Behind the lattice, she cried out, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why is the clatter of his chariots delayed? The wisest of her ladies answer her. Indeed, she keeps saying to herself, Are they not finding and dividing the spoils? A woman or two for each man. Colorful garments for plunder for Sisera. Colorful garments embroidered, highly embroidered garments for my neck, for my neck. That's what she's saying. All this as plunder. Then it switches to, so may all your enemies perish, Lord, but may all who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength. And then the conclusion, then the land had peace for 40 years. But let's look at that little description of Sisera's mother. So verse 28, Sisera's mother looks for him to return from battle. Why is his chariot so late in coming? Why doesn't he come? But what does she not know about him? He's dead. (laughs) Exactly. She does not know he's dead. So another woman answers Sisera's mother saying, aren't they just dividing the spoils? Isn't that what they're doing? Isn't that why they're so late in coming? And what's her, so what's her reason that they're not coming back? That they're just doing what? They're enjoying the victory, plundering all the booty, taking all the stuff, right? And then verse 30 What is included in this plunder? Who does it say? The girls and the women, exactly. A girl or two for each man. The literal translation from younger is a womb, a pair of wombs for the head of each warrior or man. So these Israelite women are being reduced to this sense of booty, right? Of captives, of slaves, probably, um, you know, to be raped and put into slavery. So... um, And then verse 30, what's the other booty that's also, they think, being gathered? This garments, colorful, embroidered garments. So commentator Block has uh, some great words to say about this passage. He says, he describes the the translation should be a wench or two wenches. Says, one might have expected a refined woman like Cicero's mother to be more sensitive to the vulnerability of women in the violent world of male warfare at the very least, she could have used a more neutral expression, expression like na'ara, meaning a girl or a damsel, or a ma, a maid or a handmaid. 
Her preference for this overtly sexual expression refle reflects the realities of war. To victorious soldiers, the women of vanquished foes represented military objects for their sexual gratification. Another realm to conquer. Obviously, this woman's loyalties to her son and to her own people overshadow her concern with the welfare of her gender as a group. So Sister's mother is portrayed as this greedy woman, seeing other women as objects as well, wanting something to adorn her neck. It really, we think this is probably added because it reflects the character of Sisera himself, of the Canaanites themselves. This concern for conquering, with sexuality, with fancy clothes, with worshiping possessions, with worshiping power versus worshiping the one true God. So it's a sense of contrast that these words are creating. That's such a great comment, the contrast between Jael and Deborah, right? And then this mother of Sisera, which she's concerned with, which she cares about, the instincts of her heart versus these women who submit to Yahweh. One being an outsider, right? Jael is not part of the Israelite covenant, but she's brought in because of her submissive heart to Yahweh. Great comment. Um, so we also remember that God's justice always prevails when we see things like this, that God is ultimately always going to be the victor. All right, I want to spend a few minutes on application. I would love to have you ladies think through some of these things with me. Okay, so i just love you to shout out some answers. So ladies, uh, what's Deborah like? How would you guys, ladies, describe Deborah? No right or wrong answers. Just throw stuff out. Articulate? Okay, good. What else? Faithful. Confident, faithful. Brave. What was that? Brave. Brave. Absolutely. Yeah. Leader. What was that? Leader. A leader. Absolutely. She's telling, she's speaking God's word. She knows what's true. She's telling Barak to get in shape and go. She's well-spoken. Strong. Strong. She listens to God. She hears from him. She doesn't doubt. Yeah. Great. Uh, what is Barak like? How would we describe him? Weak, yeah. Not trusting God, good. Yeah, the sense of wanting to be really sure, really make sure that he got it and he heard the correct thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we can have some... Th Say that again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe doubting that if a woman is speaking for God that it's the for sure his word. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we do have to remember it is a different time and place. There is not really judgment put on the patriarchal system. God really just talks about how to how what does it look like to be faithful to him within it. But we do have to remember it was a very patriarchal culture back then. And yes, a woman's testimony was not considered valid at this time. So for her to be the mouthpiece of God, you're right. He might have just been like, really? She's the one telling me what to do? That's true. Yeah. Deborah's husband must have believed in her and believed that she had been anointed by God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. There, one of the verses that one of the commentators I was reading mentioned is how God often uses the weak to shame the wise, right? And I think that's the sense that we see right here is that God is using the unobvious people, women, you know, outsider women to shame those who think they have power and control and authority. That that's just kind of the fun way our God tends to work, which we love. Uh, okay, what's JL like? Which, what do we see about her? She's motivated. motivated? Yeah. <laughs> Not afraid to get your hands dirty. <laughs> She's fierce. Oh, she knows how to use her charm, her power that she has. Mm. She knows who's on the winning team, yes. She's like, that's the winning team. I'm going to be on it. She is brave, fearless. Absolutely. I agree. All those things. Now, what about, um, what about the tribes that show up to battle? How would you ladies describe them? Faithful. Faithful? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What about the tribes that don't show up? Fearful. Fearful. Yeah, being run by fear. One thing I was thinking about is, does, the, does God win at the end? I mean, does Sisera's army get routed and job in eventually? He, yes. Does God win? He wins, right? Now, 
think about how it's only certain tribes, though, that show up to get be part of that. God doesn't need these tribes to show up to win, right? He can do anything he wants. He can destroy them in the Red Sea like he did with the Egyptians. But there's this privilege, this joy to showing up, to being part of God's plan, right? His plan will happen whether we show up or not. But we get to be part of it. We get to enter into it. So um, Younger also, he notes that there's a sense of apathy among those that don't show up. And out of that, he says, it's interesting, there's also an indirect support of the enemy. In their apathy of not showing up, it's an indirect support. They think they're going to lose. They think they're going to lose. So, why die? yeah, why should I die? The Lord, so this is from commentator Younger. The Lord expects his people to participate in the advancement of his kingdom. Non-involvement because of self-centeredness is as unacceptable today as in Deborah's time. Non-involvement. Yeah, sense, yeah, that those who don't show up, do they have a sense of shame for not trusting? That's really good. Um, Younger points out a couple of things that I liked. I think we've already touched on them, but he says um, we get the sense of willing vessels from this. We simply need to be willing to be used by God to show up. We don't have to be perfect or perfectly prepared or think that we've had this great pedigree of amazingness behind us. Like, he just wants us to be willing to show up. It's him who fights the battle. Um, he also talks about faith. You know, Barak doubted, but... God wants us to take him at his word and follow it wholeheartedly and not doubt. And then also the sense of involvement. Younger says, Christianity is not a spectator sport. The tribes that didn't show up are shamed in the hymn. Um, The battle then was a physical one, pushing out the Canaanites. But is our battle now physical in the sense of creating a Christian country? No, right? What is, how do we fight as Christians now, ladies? We fight in what realm? The, the spiritual realm. We fight through prayer. We fight um, against the enemy. The Bible tells us our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the powers and the principalities of this dark world. So whereas in the past God expanded a physical kingdom, now his kingdom is spread spiritually through the changed lives of men and women. And we fight our battles on a spiritual level, telling the enemy to get back from our home, to get back from our family, our lives, our work. We claim the sacred space of our lives and say, enemy, you do not have this. This is not yours. You have to get back. And um, we seek to continue to expand that spiritual kingdom one person at a time. When we love others, when we share Christ's love with others, we are, expand, we are participating in expanding God's kingdom. So, um, awesome. I think we've said it all. So, I'll give you ladies a few minutes to chat at your tables. Um, really, I just wanted you to talk about any observations or insights you ladies had from class today. And kind of, what's your takeaway? What would be something that you would sort of take away from this deep dive into the person of Deborah. And I'll put on some music and I'll, I'll close this in prayer in about seven or eight minutes.